You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode eight, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with John DeGraff, an author, filmmaker, speaker, and activist, whose mission is to help people to have a happy, healthy, and sustainable quality of life. Among his many projects is Take Back Your Time, an organization that seeks to challenge the epidemic of overwork, overscheduling, and time poverty that threatens our health, our relationships, our communities, and our environment. We're extremely pleased to welcome John DeGraff to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, John, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Great to be on your show. Thanks very much. Uh, you're active in so many different ways, including being a filmmaker, making films about the environment and climate change and sustainability, promoting happiness through the Happiness Alliance and your work with the government of Bhutan, uh, and exploring how we can see ourselves as one with nature through the Center for Humans and Nature. Uh, there's also your latest project in Beauty for All, which we're going to talk about, and I'd really like to speak to you about all of these things, but I'd like to start today on Take Back Your Time. Could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of Take Back Your Time and why you got started with it and what, what the role of that is? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Take Back Your Time actually started as a project of an organization called the Simplicity Forum, which kind of grew out of the voluntary simplicity movement of the late 1990s and uh, right around the, the turn of the millennium. Uh, I had produced a film called Affluenza, which is the most popular of my films for PBS in 1997. And as a result of that and had and speaking about the issues of overconsumption and its impact on our society and was invited to join this Simplicity Forum group. And we were meeting in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan in 2002, and we were asking what might we do to get the public to take the issues of overconsumption more seriously. And we agreed that we didn't want to do it, try to do it by a guilt trip, though we were destroying the environment or whatever. And we really felt that we had to talk about the sacrifices that were being made uh, with negative impacts on our happiness, our health, our environment, in order to pursue this dream of more and more stuff. And what we came to the conclusion was that the biggest sacrifice that Americans were making that probably they really noticed as well was working so much. We were working more than people in every other wealthy country, for example, with a, with a couple of exceptions. And uh, this, this was, uh, there was a high cost for this. So we decided to try to raise the issue of overwork, time poverty, as we called it, time pressure and stress, uh, and use that as a way to say, hey, if uh, if we weren't so obsessed with with consuming more and more, we could have a different quality of life, we could work less, and we could uh, have more time to share with each other and take care of our health. So we planned what we call Take Back Your Time Day, the first one for October 24, 2003. And uh, we picked October 24th because it was a day that fell about nine weeks before the end of the year and symbolized the fact that at that time, Americans were working on average about nine weeks longer in annual work hours than Europeans, for example. So uh, it was to call attention to how much we work in America and what the impacts of that were. And that first Take Back Your Time day in, in um 2003, we had about 200 events in various colleges and communities around the country, and we got uh, well over that uh, in terms of media stories and coverage uh, right from the top, like the New York Times and CNN and NBC, Newsweek, Time, and so forth. Uh, but it all kind of hit us hard when the when the recession happened and the collapse. People were not worried about how much they were working, uh, worried about having a job at all and it became very hard for us after that and you know we recovered a little later on but the uh it, it's it's a tough issue to get americans to think about overwork yeah i want to ask about that uh when you say it's tough for people to think about first i could imagine people wondering whether how 
real this is or how psychological it is. It, it sounds like you're saying there's real data showing that we're working more than other people and that we're even working more than we used to. It's, it's not just a feeling we have that we're working too much. It, it's absolutely not a feeling, although there is a psychological aspect to it, and, and, and some people do overwork, uh, not because they absolutely have to, but because they come to believe that, you know, that's that's who they are in in many ways. And uh, and technology, uh, which I know you're focused on, ha- has played a huge role in that because it is now suddenly possible to work all the time. I mean, it used to be people would go to their job, wherever it was, in a factory, in an office, and put in their 8 to 5 or 9 to 5, whatever it was, and they would go home, and that would essentially be the end of it. Maybe there'd be a phone call or something like that. But once we we got the computers and we've gotten the smartphones and we have the Internet and we have all those things, it really is literally possible to work around the clock. And it then has become in our society in many ways expected that people would do that. So the demands have increased. Not only are we working longer hours, we're working in more pressured fashion in many, many places, although... Uh, it is true that many people spend a certain amount of time at work just, you know, fooling around on the Internet and doing all those kind of things when the boss isn't aware. So it, it isn't that all of those extra hours are spent in uh, being productive. In fact, I, I would argue that we're less productive per hour than many of our uh, uh, friends around the world. Yeah, and what are the the real harms here of overwork. We all complain about it. We don't like it. We all say we want to work less. But I know you've looked into and found there, there's some real harm that's done to people and families and communities in the country as a whole. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, absolutely. Uh, the uh, my, uh, Overwork has enormous impacts on people's health. And we see that. Uh, we've seen that in the United States in the fact that of all rich countries, we have probably the worst health outcomes. Now, a big part of that is because of inequality and poverty in this country, but part of it is also because we don't have enough time to, to or, or think we don't, to uh, make good choices about food, to exercise. And, and when I say this, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, ignoring my own role in this, and, and I have these same issues myself with working and, and so forth, but uh, as a society, we do, and we see that in, in uh, higher rates of heart disease and other things, so life expectancy in the United States is, is lower than other rich countries, despite the fact that we spend about twice as much on health care as the average rich country does, So, uh, and that's not all because we don't do health care correctly, although I think we would do much better with a single-payer system, I think we'd still pay more because we're unhealthy, and one of the reasons we're unhealthy is that we're working too much. And that's not just about exercise or not just about being being stressed and tired. It's also about the fact that too much work means lack of social connection with others. And we know that, that being involved in your community, being socially connected, is actually the most important thing that you can do for your health. So there are studies, for example, uh, out of the University of Pittsburgh and other places that show that uh, if you release a, a virus into a room, um, and, you know, kind of uh, in the air around people in a room, uh, those most likely to get the virus are those who have the fewest friends. Uh, and that friendship and time spent with others is actually an immune builder. So this stuff is all kind of tied together. We sacrifice community. We sacrifice friendship. We sacrifice uh, family. Um, and, and we sacrifice time and nature and other important things. Uh, one interesting thing that I heard you say, in addition to the, di- let's call them the direct health impacts of overwork, you mentioned early on something about impedes people's ability to make choices uh, about things like food or health. Can you talk a little bit about that? That seems less obvious to me than just stress affecting your heart, let's say. Well, I think we can make choices, but you have to have time to think about those choices. And, you know, the the whole fast food industry is a response to 
uh, time pressure. You know, if people make the choice because it's convenient, well, what does convenient do mean? It means you can do it more quickly and therefore get on to something else. And the thing that we're we're doing a lot of is, is work. And so people, for example, the average lunch hour in the United States, which used to be called the lunch hour for a reason, it was because it lasted for an hour, uh, is now something like 27 or 28 minutes. Many people are eating at their desks, and so they, they are not making necessarily the best choices for uh, good food and, and things and, and the right kind of things. And so we 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 see this lack of awareness, uh, lack of mindfulness, if, if you want to put it that way, uh, is also uh, a result of time stress and time pressure. Yeah, and maybe we can start talking about how this might link into a lot of your other work. A lot of your other work focuses on the environment, the economy, sustainability in both of those contexts. Sure. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about how time poverty, a lack of time to make decisions, to think about things might relate to these other areas of concern to you. Well, I think as a filmmaker and a writer and a speaker, uh, I would have to sum up all of my intent as being about thinking about quality of life rather than quantity of stuff. And I, I think uh, that really was the message of the counterculture of the 1960s, which I was part of, was that, you know, we're too obsessed with materialism, too obsessed with stuff, and we need to be thinking about community, we need to be thinking about nature, we need to be thinking about uh, time and leisure and, and uh, doing the things that we we believe in and care about rather than just the things that, that make money. So everything that I've done has kind of had some relation to that, whether it be films about alternative agriculture or films about uh, time and, and work time issues or other uh, happiness. Uh, you know, that's that's been the one that I've been involved in. As you mentioned, I got involved because of the time movement uh, and my work on time, I was invited to speak in Brazil and then later to, to work with the government of Bhutan uh, because one of Bhutan, Bhutan has established this idea called gross national happiness. A lot of people have heard about this. Their king said that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And uh, one of the nine domains of happiness or well-being in, in uh, the Bhutanese model in their system is time balance. And so I was kind of considered for my work on Take Back Your Time to be something of an expert on time balance. Uh, I'm not sure that's at all true, but in any case, uh, I had done some studies. I knew what the laws were around the world, around work time, and things like that. So I was invited to speak at conferences about time balance as part of the overall happiness picture. And I wasn't aware of the happiness movement until those invitations, but when I went to Brazil first, uh, I found out uh, a lot of what people were doing to try to think about why don't we measure happiness and why don't governments work for well-being and happiness rather than GDP, uh, for example. And so uh, uh, learning that, I came back to the States and with some friends started a, this group now called the Happiness Alliance. Uh, and we used a survey, which is available at the website happy counts h a p p y c o u n t s dot org. It's a fifteen minute survey that people can take that uh, tells them how well they're doing in all of these key domains that Bhutan has identified as being important for happiness. And then most recently, I've just gotten very interested in the idea that the concept of of beauty of both preserving and protecting and restoring natural beauty, but also revitalizing our towns and cities by making them more beautiful, more livable, more pedestrian friendly, all of those kind of things, uh, could be a way to um, respond to the extreme polarization that we see in the United States today. And it could be a unifying thing that can bring people together because everybody cares about where they live. Yeah, and th this is amazing. And uh... I do want to pick up on uh, something you mentioned earlier about the, the challenges you faced, I think, with Take Back Your Time. I don't know if it's uh, uniquely American, but it, it occurs to me that we talk about things like happiness, beauty in America, uh, where people 
on the whole, tend to be very pragmatic. I wonder if that's part of the challenge you've, you've faced, that people may yearn for these things, and yet it's a difficult thing to talk about or to get people to feel motivated about in this country. Well, I think so. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the trade-offs here are uh, that we are a, a bit more obsessed than people uh, are in other places with the notion that... Uh, well-being is defined in economic terms, you know, how how big is your house, you know, what kind of car you drive, uh, all of these kinds of things. And, and the business and of America is business, right? The business of America is business, and, and, and in the business of America is, is wealth, you know, and we define wealth in very material terms. Not everybody, and if you if you boil it down and you actually talk to people personally, most people say that they understand that that's not a good idea, but with our institutions, our government, everything, I mean, that's how we measure things, uh, that's, it's just sort of there, and if you challenge that in some way, you're seen as being naive, um, you're seen as being uh, out there in a way, uh, to bring up happiness, for example, sometimes can produce a lot of laughter, oh mm -hmm. my goodness, you know, this is sort of a silly, a silly concept, but it's not, and and the nations of the world have actually uh, virtually unanimously voted in the United Nations to say that all countries should really be measuring happiness and well-being of their citizens rather than GDP, and using those measurements to guide their policies. So I think that the world is starting to get this, uh, but in the United States, there's still some skepticism. We're cynical, and I, we're getting more cynical all the time, of course, and um, in no small measure because of what's going on today in our country. But, um, you know, it, it came from that kind of cynicism, that kind of distrust that we could do things together, the distrust, for instance, that government actually could serve the will of the people and make things in the country better for us because we democratically agreed to do those things. So I look back at the turning point of all of this as uh, when I was a young man in the 1960s, when Lyndon Johnson, who was at the time the president, uh, really was focused on many of these kind of things. He, his great society speech was all about changing, was not only about uh, civil rights and poverty, although those were important aspects of it. It was also about changing our frame in the United States away from economic growth and wealth toward the idea of quality of life and beauty and protection of the environment. And Johnson gave speech after speech on this, and he established a whole campaign for preserving natural beauty and for conservation, many, many bills. Uh, this was uh, a place where he and the counterculture were clearly aligned with each other, and the environmentalists were aligned. The problem is that we as a country became very polarized over Johnson's involvement in the Vietnam War. And in my view, uh, the fights that took place over the war became kind of all-consuming. They grabbed up all the headlines and the news, and, and I was one of the protesters, and, and it sucked the air out of the room. There was not much else to think about. So we weren't really even aware of the good things in terms of actually helping to eliminate poverty. The war on poverty was successful. Um, what it was doing uh, for um, which. I think we are aware of, and what it was doing for for the environment and with more new national parks and, and uh, saving of clean air and water and rivers. I mean, this was an immense period in which government was doing many things wonderfully, uh, and yet all of that was over over clouded by uh, the war in Vietnam. And I think the war in Vietnam then soured people almost entirely on government and what government could do, including people like me. And so uh, what happened was a, a few years later, Reagan was able to come in and say, well, government can't be the solution to our problems because government itself is the problem. Mm -hmm. And as we got further and further in that kind of attitude, we no longer really believed that we could do things as a common society, working together with others. And we became and are now phenomenally polarized between those who, who see government as the problem, period, and others who see 
big corporations and so forth as a problem that needs some correction from the government. So um, that all of that makes it somewhat hard to raise these issues of a different way of thinking. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm feeling that the, the concept of uh, beauty can be a real uniter. There's uh, Doug Tompkins, who founded the, the clothing company Esprit, one of the biggest clothing companies in the world, um, it was known to say that if anything can save the world, that Tompkins said, I'd put my money on beauty. And he said that for a reason, that he did think it was a uniter. We have studies, for instance, that show that being around beauty makes people kinder to each other. It makes builds community. It makes people more uh, just and more compassionate. Uh, all of these, these kind of things, more mindful. And so uh, I think Tompkins is right. And that's going to be my focus for the next few years, at least. In light of the, all the challenges you talked about, what gives you hope uh, that this can uh, be successful in the United States, that it can help people be happier to appreciate beauty and make it be more part of their lives? Are, are there any signs that you've seen in this country that give you hope about it? Well, one thing that's clear is that people um, across the political spectrum appreciate natural beauty. Uh, conservatives like their gardens as much as, as liberals do. Uh, they visit the national parks in, in big numbers. Um, I don't think that they, uh, in fact, uh, Frank Lantz, who's a Republican pollster and focus group leader, uh, told the Bush administration some years ago that it, they better not try to undercut the national park system because their conservative constituents like those parks and visited those parks and cared about those parks just as much as the liberals did. And I think that's true. I think we can see that these are universal things that people care about, and uh, beauty of surroundings is one of those. Uh, people like uh, going to these European cities where there are big plazas and open places where people can walk that are free of cars. And you, know, and you, you see people, uh, it's not just you know, northern liberals, there's plenty of southerners in those cities visiting and enjoying it just as much. So I, I think uh, that gives me hope that people do uh, care about this issue. And the other thing that gives me hope is that the response so far has been so positive and so strong uh, to this idea. And there's been very little resistance. Now it's early, and I'm sure there will be. And the resistance will always come not over the concept, but over the trade-offs that are seen. You know, well, it might be beautiful and stuff, but we need the oil, or mm -hmm. this or that. Uh, these, these kind of arguments are where it tends to bog down. But I think if you can kind of agree on a, a first principle, that beauty matters, that people don't uh, uh, may not always agree on what's most beautiful, but they, they do know what's ugly, and they don't mm -hmm. want to live in, in you know, uh, pollution and garbage and things, and they they want to live in in beautiful surroundings. So if you can start with a common interest, then you may be able to begin to talk about some other things as well. And I think um, uh, uh, one of the ideas that I had is is to look at a situation like the Appalachian Mountains and the coal miners. And uh, you know, the, our president has told these coal miners that they can go on mining coal and that he's going to bring back the coal industry, but even if that weren't a dumb thing to do, it's probably not going to happen because the market isn't anymore, and the market has been moving rapidly toward natural gas and solar and things. So do you tell them, like uh, uh, some of the Republican think tanks and even some of the Democrats have told them, well, just get a U-Haul and move. You know, uh, mm -hmm. just pack your stuff up and go somewhere where the jobs are. Uh, or uh, you may say, well, go to the community college and study IT and get an IT, to, you know, a uh, associate's degree and go move to a city. But the fact is, that's not very easy for these people because uh, they can't sell their homes. This who's going to buy them? They don't have the money and the down payments and things to buy homes anywhere else. They would have to find a, jo a job. They really are fearful, even of the the city, and they'll be giving up their community and their actual love for nature. I mean, they may they may trade off by doing this mining and things like that, but they actually like to be out in the woods, whether it's for hunting or fishing or whatever. So what if you say to these coal miners, 
No, there's a different answer. The different answer is a, a, a national program like the CCC of the 1930s in which we pay unemployed coal miners not to dig more coal or strip more mountainsides, but to restore the mountainsides that have already been and mountaintops that have already been destroyed. There are 530 of them. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in planting trees and 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 uh, improving the land, and that would also protect uh, the watersheds and, and all of those things. Uh, people will say to me, well, the coal miners don't want to do that. They, they, they think that's some environmental tree hugger, <laughs> you know, nonsense. But the fact is that some coal miners are already doing it on their own. They've started a group called Refresh Appalachia, where they've already restored three mountaintops. Now, that's a drop in the bucket out of 530, but it shows that they want to do this, and they've turned these into um, forests and organic farms, and they've done this primarily on their own dimes. Coal miners have done this. So uh, you can't tell me that people don't want to do the right thing if we make it possible for them to do the right thing. And it sounds to me like you're saying there doesn't have to be a trade-off or dichotomy that's often posed between uh, jobs and the environment, for example. You know, we're often told that you have to pick one or the other. It's a zero-sum game between those two. No, there doesn't, but we have, do have to understand that there's a cost, and that that cost, uh, it would make sense to be borne um, by us as a nation. We understood that it was valuable to preserve our national resources and to uh, pay taxes to do that, for example, in the 1930s and, and up through the 1960s. We've now come to believe that it's every man and woman for themselves, uh, and so there's this terrible anti-tax fervor and this whole idea that we should make government so small we can drown it in a bathtub, as, as one of the Republican leaders has said. And so you have to get around that. You have to say there's a lot of money in America, but it really needs to be uh, put in, in, into things that will be beneficial for, for all of us and for the country. And that's a hard sell. That's where it gets tougher. I'm wondering, you know, who who were you're trying to sell to? So we've talked about federal government. Uh, I suppose there would be state governments, uh, nonprofit or other private organizations, or even local communities or individuals. I mean, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what people can do at these different levels when it comes to being able to pursue beauty and happiness more in their lives. Absolutely. Well, there is a role for everybody, and there's a role for the individual without any government involvement in in working to beautify and talk their communities. And, and uh, we see many people doing this, you know, and, uh, and there's certainly a role for city governments and state governments. And we see a lot of this in a positive sense, even in places that where there's great antagonism toward the federal government. So, for example, uh, in a place like Greenville, South Carolina, an uh, awful lot has been done at the local level really to preserve uh, beauty, to provide trails and bike paths and save old buildings and do those kind of things, uh, uh, even though uh, many of those people may, may vote against the exact same thing being done at a national level. So, so there's some things that we, we can really do at the state, local level, at the personal level, in our communities, uh, with our friends. But there are some things that take, will probably take uh, an outflow of national resources to make possible. So I think of Appalachia as one of those places because, you know, these are poor communities. They can't really restore the mountaintops on themselves. They, you know, they are the unemployed and they're hurting. And it's even though they've tried a few of these minor hurt groups, very tough. And so in these areas, we need to look at this as, as something that the country as a whole has to support and has to get behind. But in many places, these things can be done at the community level. And I think what's rich uh, potentially about the beauty campaign is that people have so many ways that they can participate from, you know, cleaning up the litter in their parks or communities to to uh, planting things to uh, working on uh, setting aside spaces in their in their communities where that are just for people the, the city of Portland Oregon for example there's a, a city repair organization in Portland which has done a lot to actually take 
uh, intersections and places in the city and make them for pedestrians so that people can come together in those places. Uh, We see uh, building farmers markets is a huge uh, positive thing. We're seeing that more and more in communities uh, all over, including quite conservative communities, where uh, these this becomes a place where people get together. One thing we know is that there are about 10 times as many conversations that take place between people in farmers markets than in supermarkets. So this is a community builder, uh, and, and people can do this in many, many ways, but we can't do it all just by personal initiative. We also need the role of of uh, of government at different levels to uh, help coordinate the larger things that have to be done, and also set some of the rules, particularly in terms of things like pollution and and so forth. Sure. I mean, it's very interesting. The example of the farmer's market uh, calls to mind for me a place that in itself can be beautiful to experience and have these other benefits uh, that contribute to happiness uh, as I wouldn't say opposed to. But if you think about uh, visiting a national park might be more of a pure uh, experience of of. Of beauty, but there you give in the farmers market an example of something that brings together beauty, happiness, commerce, environment, food, community, you know, all together in one place. Well, I think so. I think it's a good one, and and uh, I think we need more of these kind of public spaces where people can come together and interact. And and uh, this has got to be a private public partnership. I'm not certainly not suggesting that government can do everything. Uh, but I, I think the big problem in our country now is not the sense that government can do everything, but that it can do nothing, and that whatever it does is negative. And I, I think that's a terrible view. I don't think that's the view that our founding fathers and mothers had. And uh, I think they, they built a country with the idea that people democratically working together could make make things happen. And I think we see that in many of the European countries where uh, the vital rural communities, for example, have been preserved. When you travel around France and Switzerland and Austria and places, you see these beautiful towns uh, out in the middle of the, the countryside that are doing well. And, and they were do- that's happened because policy has helped to make that happen. By contrast, we go to much of, of rural America and we see boarded up uh, buildings, and we see, you know, uh, what looks like a kind of forlorn and desolate landscape. Not all, and some rural communities have really been doing a good job to change that, but that requires, uh, again, the willingness of those people to come together, and at least at the local level. I'm curious what you have to say about the role of... Uh... Architecture might be the right word for this in creating some of these spaces. You know, uh, I've lived in many places where there is no place even where a farmer's market could be or where there aren't places that are physically designed to allow people to walk casually, let's say without cars or to sit and stop in an open public space together and perhaps meet friends or meet people they don't know. You know what what could you say about the role of architecture in all of these areas? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Both both uh, regular architecture and landscape architecture have a huge role to play in making uh, cities and spaces more livable and, and uh, happier. You know, there's a book called The Happy City that really explores how these different models of housing and uh, and patterns of commerce and such uh, work differently. And we, we see some good examples of this, um, you know, in, in places like uh, Denmark and the Netherlands and other places where where the city architecture really does make a place for bicycles and for pedestrians and where um, benches and tables are set up in street corners and things so people will actually just stop and socialize. We see it in the uh, Mexican plazas or even the New England uh, greens and in places where people can come together uh, where something is held in common, a commons, and is not all privately uh, occupied and 
um, where there's green space and all of these kind of things. We we can do this. We can plan well using architecture. Uh, we should do this so much more. I mean, I often wonder where where much of our country would be if we had the attitudes in the late 1800s and the early 1900s that we have today. I mean, Olmsted would never have built Central Park <laughs> because it wouldn't have been allowed. It would have been, that's real estate that somebody can make money on. Trump can put a tower there, you know. Uh, uh, and and we didn't do those things. We 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 built Boston Commons and Central Park and Golden Gate Park and all of these kind of things. We preserved uh, Yellowstone and Yosemite and and these kind of things. If, if we had today's attitudes. I'm wondering if we would do those things. Yeah, and it, it it seems like it brings back in the issue of time, which is these spaces facilitate a perhaps slower, more comfortable pace uh, than certainly than being in a car. Uh, Absolutely, you know they allow people to slow down. Absolutely, and you see that in in Europe and the coffee houses. Now, now we're seeing some of that happening. The United States is a is a is certainly not a place without many of these things going on. I mean, I think we're seeing we see a lot of negative and positive stuff happening at the same time. So we're seeing uh, more sprawl, more strip development, and things things like that. But at the same time, in many of our urban centers, we are seeing outdoor cafes that didn't used to be here 10 years ago, uh, people getting out. Uh, Seattle is an example of that. We're, we're seeing both the good and the bad happening at the same time. We're seeing this, you know, tremendous con- traffic congestion and pushing into the city and, and crowding uh, and expensive uh, housing and so forth. But at the same time, we're seeing, um, you know, more places where people actually can get to get get together, get outside, and so forth. So, I think you, you, we have to figure out how we emphasize the one uh, more so than than the other, because that that seems to be an issue. But there's a lot of good stuff going on, and and little communities are doing good stuff, and I I see this as I travel. I wonder what you could suggest to people. Let's say at the community level, if they want to head in this direction of bringing more happiness and beauty to the places where they live, are there there things you could suggest to them to do with pointing to models of what other people have done or been successful at? Well, let, let's take the uh, cities, for example, um, and particularly some of our cities that are, that are in the worst trouble. I mean, maybe these cities that are going to provide the best models for the future for us. So if you take the places like Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Milwaukee, those places are now beginning to be used in many, many concerts. We see, for example, in in, uh, Milwaukee and Chicago, we see these enormous urban farms, also Detroit, being created primarily by uh, African-American leaders. And these these farms, uh, these urban farms, produce millions of dollars worth of food. They employ hundreds of teenagers and and kids who might otherwise be in gangs or doing drugs or something else to grow this uh, food. They've created nature centers, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, What I think we need to do is to disseminate the information about these kind of things that are happening. And that's one of the other things we want to do with the And Beauty for All campaign. And one of our plans is to have a day next October 2nd, uh, uh, 2018, not this not this year, but 2018, that we're going to call Anne Beauty for All Day. And we've chosen that date because it's the 50th anniversary of the day when Lyndon Johnson signed four very significant what I would call beauty bills. Uh, it was referred to at the time as Conservation's Grand Slam. Uh, <laughs> so on that day... On that day, Johnson signed the act creating the Redwoods National Park, the North Cascades National Park in Washington State, uh, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Bill, which has allowed many communities to protect their rivers uh, from dams and so forth, and the National Scenic Trails Act. And I think all those things are a symbol of what we can do, that we save the Redwoods, that the Redwoods are more than board feet. Uh, they have a spiritual value to us and a 
you know, place of, for mindfulness and so forth. We say the North Cascades because some land has to be simply left untouched. Uh, and, and, you know, we've we've started to protect our rivers. So these are examples. Uh, I think on that day, we're hoping that communities, colleges, people all over will celebrate and duty for all day and start to replicate some of these ideas. Well, that's great. We'll share uh, links to information about that. Uh, in, right. in, with this podcast. And when you said part of what you're doing is to share information with people, I believe, about what beauty is around them, I wonder if if you find that people are just not aware of, let's say, the national parks or state parks or rivers or, or any other natural places of beauty that might be basically in their backyard. Well, I think they are getting more aware. You know, certainly people are aware of the na- na- national parks, and national parks visitation is is at an all-time high. The, one of the problems, though, is as people have very little time, and as as they kind of crowd into the very few iconic national parks, you know, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone, places like that, um, I think they're missing out on a lot of the, the other areas that are beautiful, maybe near them, that are the the state state parks, the national forest lands, uh, and so forth. So they're very aware of the national parks, but not as aware of the other beauty that's available and less crowded and less overrun. And the other problem I see, it, and this goes down to what you're talking about, about technology and mindfulness and all of this sort of thing, is that they uh, the way the, the way people visit parks has changed in a very important way. For example, uh, a generation ago, the average visitor to Yosemite spent about 50 hours in the park. 80% of visitors stayed overnight, for example. Today, the average visitor to Yosemite spends less than five hours in the park, and only about 20% of visitors stay uh, overnight. And people just rush through the park uh, they have their smartphones out before they have even looked at the scenery, and they're, the first view they have of the waterfalls of Yosemite is through their, the lens of their smartphone, uh, you know, because of the rush. And some don't even stop. I mean, they just slow their cars down and take the pictures out the window. So the idea seems to be collect as many photographs as possible, but not experience the mm-hmm. awe that's really involved in a place like this, uh, the gra- average ca- visitor to the Grand Canyon today spends 17 minutes looking at the canyon, according to studies. And I heard one story of a family that stopped at an overlook at the Grand Canyon. The father got out of the car and, and said to the rest of the people in the car, uh, stay in the car, I'll get the shot. Mm. It makes me wonder whether there's uh, a value to promoting a you know park without your smartphone day or something something well, like really, that. No, uh, <laughs> and people are doing that, and I think it's a very important thing to do. And they're taking kids out for a week, you know, into the wilderness or into a park without the phones. And and, um, and the, the first couple of days, the usual experience is that the kids are really upset; they just can't handle it, you know. But but then. But toward the end of the trip, they're starting to like it. Not that they don't want their phones back, but they've actually really said, hmm, but there's something else to life out there that I like. Yeah, they they go through a short period of withdrawal. Uh. Great. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I met some kids in Lowry near National Park a few years ago. They were inner city kids from Tacoma, Washington. They grew up in a neighborhood that was, you know, gang infested and where um, it was typical here, you know, shots at night and people were killed. And they they went on this uh, 10 day hiking trip in uh, in, uh, Mount Rainier, guided by a ranger. And when I I met the kids about day seven, and they all said that the first couple days in the woods, they were just terrified. You know, there are bears in the woods, and uh, the kids are growing up around gunfire and stuff, but they were terrified of the woods. But by day seven, they were really loving things. They were talking about, I can build a, get to build a snowman in August, and I can see the shooting stars. And, and some of them said, I'd love to have the job that the ranger has. These were tough street kids who were saying it. So it shows that this kind of appreciation of beauty and wonder uh, may atrophy, but it, it doesn't, it's not eliminated. 
Yeah, and another thing it makes me think of is in mindfulness practice, one thing we often experience is that there is something that's uncomfortable for a short period of time. And if we stay with it, rather than run away from it immediately, we might find that it passes or fades or changes. And, you know, if we can encourage ourselves and others to to stick it out through those uncomfortable feelings, we might find a totally different experience at the other end of it. I agree. So I wonder what you uh, could tell um, individuals. We've talked about communities. We've talked about federal government, local government. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. And I'm, I'm going to say, John, I love everything you've got to say. It sounds great to me, but I don't have time. I don't have time mm-hmm. to do it. I don't I'm, I don't have money to do it. I don't live near uh, things of natural beauty. And I love to do it. But if sorry, it's just not practical for me. Well, I think there's going to be some of that, and, and uh, it's not necessarily practical for uh, everybody to do some of these things. So I, I think you have to say, what what am I capable of? You know, can I do it uh, by uh, uh, helping out, joining a, a little group, and, and helping clean up things? I mean, people have, people do, Although I'm a great advocate of more time for people, I also understand that a lot of time that we do have is frittered away in um, with devices and with things like that and with television and so forth. Uh, so that people people do have a time, and they may find that if they get out and do some things with their neighbors, it makes a difference. Let me let me give you a good example of a place that I love uh, that is kind of my model for what um, what I've talked about here. And it's, it's a place where beauty, uh, saving natural beauty, actually brought together a very polarized community. So I'm thinking of a place called Nevada City, California, where uh, I'm, that I'm working on a film about right now. And this was a city uh, that was the richest town in the California gold rush of the 18. 18- 50s and 60s, and the land then was completely trashed. The environment was destroyed uh, in order to get the gold. Mount, whole mountaintops were, and mountainsides were washed away to get the gold, and the destruction was enormous. And then in the 60s and 70s, the back to the land movement, the counterculture found this place, and they moved there, and they had a different ethic, which was, you know, um, find a place, take care of it. Well, these two groups, the extracted, the miners, and, and other people, and the hippies, uh, people called the rednecks, and they were sort of at each other's throats for about 15 years. And then came a common threat to the beauty that they really shared, which was a thing called the Yuba River. And the plan was to dam, put dams on this river. And the river was a place that everybody, right and left, you know, uh, red, white, and blue, appreciated. And they they got together. The hippies actually started the campaign to stop the dams, but they found that 80% of Republican men in their county didn't want the dams to happen. They they liked the river too, mm. and so they united. They used the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which I mentioned was passed. You know, was signed on October 2nd, 1968, uh, 50 years ago next year. They used that, and they got the river, the dams stopped. And then they began to build an organization, uh, which people join called the South Yuba River Citizens League. It is now a very large and an effective organization, has been for 30 years in that community. Uh, they get six to 700 people. Um, this is a town of 3,200. They get six to 700 people out on their river cleanup activities, for example, uh, in all kinds of things. They have a film festival where they get 700 volunteers. Uh, once you start doing this, and they started around beauty, I think people respond. Well, that's an amazing story. I mean, you're talking about people from across the political divide coming together to protect and preserve and beautify the place that they live in. Yeah, and it's it's happening. I mean, it's not that there isn't still some tension and things, and that there aren't still disagreements, because, of course, there are. But uh, I think they've they've come a long way, and they found they've learned how to talk to each other even when they disagree. That's amazing. Well, 
Thanks so much, John, for talking to us today about time, environment, the economy, sustainability, happiness, and beauty, and how all of them interrelate <laughs> with each other. It's really incredible. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, John DeGraff, the founder of Take Back Your Time. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thank you.